Namahi Mahana Kia Koto Katoa. Um call Linda Johnston Toku Ingoa. Uh, thank you all very much for coming here and joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to be your MC for this evening. Before I explain the order of events and, and how this event will run, I thought I'd share an experience with you. I recently went to the movie Maverick Top Gun. <laughs> Have you seen it? It's two hours and 11 minutes of non-stop action. As a professor of geography and assistant vice chancellor sustainability, I couldn't even begin to calculate the carbon emissions. <laughs> but I could analyze the movie's themes, such as economies dedicated to war and built on hegemonic masculinities, softened up with a bit of heteronormative romance, or revolving around holding up the United States geopolitical world position as a superpower who's going to save all of us from the bad people. I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. Um, I enjoyed the obvious performance of such themes. I also enjoyed that I could put these themes into words. Being an academic, doing research, as our presenters will show tonight, teaches us to analyse and represent our arguments. Even if they're about movies that we take our dad to see, Universities, as all of us know here tonight, are places where, where we can test and contest ideas. The other thing about that movie that reinforced for me is that one needs to focus single-mindedly on the issues. And doing a thesis, a PhD thesis, is just like this. It has to be at the forefront of your mind. So as the MC for the next maybe two hours, two and 11 minutes, two hours and 11 minutes. Please sit back, enjoy our students as they present their incredible research projects. It promises to be non-stop action. Um, but first, um, I'd like to invite Professor Karen Bryan, our Dean of Te Mata Kairanga School of Graduate Research, who will extend a warm welcome to you all, give an overview of the event. <laughs> Just make sure I'm middle talk. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Na mihi nui kia koto katoa. A very warm welcome indeed to the three minute thesis competition for 2020. 2022, sorry. <laughs> so, ko Karen Bryan toko inoe. I'm Karen Bryan. I'm the um, new dean of Tamata Kairangi, um, the School of Graduate Research. And, um, well, at Tamata Kairangi, we are, we're kind of helpers. We help our divisions, the faculty, and all our academic supervisors from around the university to guide our doctoral students through their research journey to the final completion. And we have 600, more than 600 students working throughout the university. Their projects are very diverse, and I'm learning about them a lot, even from areas outside my own, which is science. Um, and we help them a lot, not just uh, through motivation and that kind of thing, but also the general skills they need to succeed. And it's not the skills that are happening while they're enrolled in their PhD, but also the ones that they need afterwards. Our graduates go into a really wide range of high-level jobs. And I say high-level because that's the added skills that they have allows them to get into those jobs. And quite a few of them end up overseas. We have graduates who have become CEOs, chief scientists, politicians, and even academics. <laughs> well, all sorts. But one thing in common is that they can think through complex problems and they can find pathways through them for themselves, but they also learn that to do that for people around them. We're really proud of our doctoral program. 
Um, the reason that we support so many doctoral students at Waikato is that they form the cornerstone of our research strength and reputation. They are the foundation. They're really innovative and they have the chance and the focus to be innovative. The books, the papers, the theses they're writing, they'll be read and valued by people all over the world. Our students get citations and readers from everywhere. Um, helping our relatively small university, allowing it to bat, before, bat, bat higher than its weight. We do really well in rankings considering our size. Um, we're also known in the community for really good quality, relevant research. Our students are really connected to the region. Um, they're uh, often funded by our very generous donors and our industry partners. Quite a few of them went to Waikato themselves. Now, back to this event. Of the skills that graduates need, the ability to tell a research story, and it is a story you're telling when you're up here um, presenting, in a captivating way that can reach a really wide range of people and bring them forward is really, really important. Gone are the days that we can sit on our ivory towers and work on interesting but kind of obscure problems. Today we're facing a bit of a crisis, a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, a world with p pandemics, kind of unstable politics, the economics are unsure, it's kind of a day when we really need all hands to the pump. And our doctoral students are clever. They can think in really innovative ways, and, but they need to be able to convince you that they're part of that solution. They're sort of those future engines of innovation. Which brings me to this particular event. The thesis, uh, the three minute th thesis is about the art of communicating research to an interested but not necessarily specialized audience. It's a chance also to celebrate the exciting types of research we're doing at Waikato. And so it's our pleasure to present you this research tonight. Um, it's not just a Waikato event, Waikato event. It's actually a global competition now. It originated at the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008, so it's more than 10 years old now. Um, the idea came, came for it when they were having a big drought. And the uh, people were recommended that they shouldn't stay in the shower too long because you use up water. And in fact, they should only have a shower for three minutes. So lots of people got egg timers um, to time their three-minute showers. And the dean of the University of Queensland, the dean of the graduate school, so me, I guess, in that position, um, was thinking about this, having their three-minute shower, and thought, wow, we could have a competition just like this. Well, it's now held over 600 universities and institutions and in 59 different countries. And in 2016, it expanded from just being trans-Tasman to include a number of Asian universities. And so now it's called officially the Asia-Pacific 3MT um, competition. And that's where the winner of tonight's competition will be headed virtually in October. Okay, and the one interesting and, and cool thing about 3MT is the rules are the same all over the world. They have just three minutes, not three minutes and one second, not three minutes, mine, they have three minutes and no more. They can't try twice, just the once, it's only one shot. They have one static PowerPoint slide, which would literally be torture for me because I love animations. I'm not allowed to use that. And it needs to be pitched to a, a non-specialist intelligent audience, and they will be judged by a panel of academic and non-academic people looking at the three areas of the three criterion, comprehension, engagement, and communication. So now I'll hand you back to our MC, Professor Johnson, will introduce you to our judges um, and explain the details of tonight's competition. Before I do, I want to thank you all very much for coming. We're delighted to host you. Delighted that you've come to hear our students and supporting them and to support them. Um, I'd also like to thank the advisors um, that have been putting so much work into this um, event and the events team at the, um, at the, the Arts Centre and they've been put a huge amount of work into this. And of course, our judges, who Linda is going to introduce much more eloquently than I will. And um, 
Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Thank you, Professor Brian. Um, I will go right into introducing the judges. We are delighted to have you here. Thank you again from me. Um, first judge, Tania Simpson, uh, Naitahu, Napuhi, and Tainui Iwi. Tania is uh, committed to improving outcomes for Māori and, and supporting treaty relationships, holds a number of directorships, including director of Tainui Group Holdings, uh, Meridian Energy, and Auckland Airport. Tania is also a member of our Waitangi Tribunal, the Deputy Chair of Waitangi National Trust, and chairs the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge um, as a member of the Deep so South National Science Challenge Board as well. Kia ora, Tania. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and another judge, Marlene Julian. Marlene has for uh, many years uh, been involved in the not-for-profit sector, having been a trustee for the Brian Perry Charitable Trust, uh, formerly Perry Foundation, for 30 years. And Marlene was instrumental in establishing POET, the Perry Outdoor Education Trust, remains the chair of that organisation. Uh, this, this particular organisation is working with low decile secondary schools uh, through engaging them with outdoor experiences. So thank you very much for coming and being here tonight and judging. Um, a third judge, Keith Gallagher, um, is, um, is with us tonight. Thank you, Keith, for being here. Works as an electrics engineer in Wairarapa, uh, has worked in Wairarapa, England, Auckland, and now in Kirikiriroa as uh, electronics technical leader. Associated with the university for a number of years, currently the engineering advisory board chairperson and, and contains another a number of community roles, including trustee of the Gallagher Charitable Trust and Gallagher Foundation. Importantly, is a husband and father of three busy children as well. That's wonderful. So a round of applause for our judges. Um, thank you so much for being here and making this happen and, and spending your evening with us. We also have another very important person here, as uh, Professor Brian mentioned. It's only three minutes. And so we have a uh, timekeeper, Andrea Carney, sitting down here with the very important iPad. Now, the iPad... Uh, runs down the minutes, so our speakers here, our presenters, will be able to see that iPad. When it gets to 30 minutes before the end of that, Andrea will hold up this, an orange card, so they know that the time is near the end. So thank you very much, Andrea, for being that timekeeper. Let me explain the um, prizes a little bit more. Read that page. Now, the winner of this evening will receive the Professor John D. McCraw Memorial Award and $1,000 to put towards their research. The winner will also compete against candidates, if we heard, as we've heard, from more than 40 other tertiary institutions. And this is in the Asia Pacific Virtual 3MT semi finals. Um, and that's due for Monday the 26th of September. Potentially also the Asia Pacific 3MT finals on Wednesday the 19th of October. Now the runner-up will also receive a prize, $500, towards, to put towards their research. There is another prize and it's the People's Choice Prize. So you will see in the program, you'll also see around the building on the walls a QR code. And after we've had the presentations, we invite you to vote for your favourite uh, presentation. And, you'll, and we'll do that during the break. Um, and I'll remind you before we do break that that's one of our jobs to do over the break as you're deliberating and talking about who was the best um, for you. The competition will run like this. So each finalist with their three minutes. Um, each, fi each finalist, of course, has been practicing uh, long and hard. Um, I will uh, call the finalists through, uh, one, each finalist one by one. 
the timekeeper will be ready. And um, we'll move through them fairly quickly through that. And I must um, let you know that one of our presenters tonight um, cannot be here as home isolating, but will be with us virtually um, to uh, talk about their research, and that is Christopher Dunn. So unfortunately, Christopher can't be included in part of the competition, but still wishes to share their research. So I'm really delighted that um, Christopher can do that. In terms of housekeeping in the building, um, if you please check your cell phones are off. We very much do not need to interrupt our three minutes with someone's phone beeping or, or ringing. Uh, also, please keep still as the presenters are delivering their three minutes of thesis. If there is an event that we need to evacuate the building, um, please follow the instructions of your crew or the staff here. Um, follow the exit signs out into the foyer and then out into the concrete pad. You'll, you'll be directed outside um, there. The bathrooms are opposite the um, refreshment area down the main area and left if you need to use those as well. Right, we're at that particular time where I can start to introduce each speaker. So I am delighted to be able to um, bring forward uh, the very first speaker, just checking that I've got all, everything ready. Yes. Um, our first speaker tonight is Chris Karma Walter. Kia ora koutou and good evening. Whether it be potatoes, kumara, rice or bread, most of us have a favourite starch-filled food that we truly love. Surprisingly, kiwi fruit vines also love starch. So much so that every autumn they fill themselves up with starch, then have a nice long sleep over winter, and when they wake up again in spring, they use their starch reserves to grow new tissues, including leaves, roots, and flowers. In this way, low starch content in kiwi fruit wood can limit flower production in spring, reducing fruit yields and lowering profitability. What you can see on my slide are not what most people think, some crazy new varieties of fruit. They are in fact cross-sectional slices of kiwi fruit wood, each no thicker than a human hair. These wood slices have been stained and then imaged under a microscope. In the top left, iodine has been used to stain starch black. The beige regions are tough wood fibres, and the white circles are xylem vessels, which are essentially water pipes. While this makes for a cool picture, we want to be able to use these images to quantify the amount of starch stored in the wood. We can do this using machine learning based tools to process and simplify these images at a far greater rate than any human could. An example of this is shown in the bottom left where an image has been simplified down to three colors, black, yellow, and white. To extract quantitative data, we simply tally the number of pixels of each color in the image. This by itself can give us very useful information, but it's only half the story. To get the full picture of what's going on in the wood, we also need to know what the starch storage capacity is, as it may not necessarily be filled up due to adverse growing conditions. We can assess this using a combination of two different stains, and you can see this in the top right. Here, cells that can store starch appear bluey purple, while those that cannot store starch appear magenta red. Again, we can use machine learning based tools to process these images and extract quantitative data. In my research, I plan to use these techniques to assess how environmental conditions and management practices influence wood anatomy and how this affects starch storage capacity, the total amount of starch, and the proportion of the capacity that's actually filled up. By providing these insights to kiwi fruit growers, they will be able to maximize their wood starch storage, resulting in increased flower production, higher fruit yields, and increased profits. It is my hope that this will further strengthen the $2.7 billion New Zealand kiwi fruit industry and give both kiwi fruit growers and consumers yet one more reason to truly love starch. Nga mihi and thank you. Time if you need to chat or move around uh, between contestants, uh, you can absolutely do that while we get ready for the next one. Um, 
tough job for the judges as they make their notes. Uh, wonderful to be underway. There will be an intermission after all the presenters have um, gone through their uh, three minutes. We're ready for our next presenter. I'm delighted to welcome Lakshmi Muthi to our stage. What is the one manufacturing method that can be used to build houses, cars, spacecrafts, and even human body parts? The answer is 3D printing. A 3D printer's mechanism is not very different from that of your desktop printers. A desktop printer reads a digital file and deposits ink onto a paper to form a document, whereas a 3D printer reads a computer design and deposits material onto the print bed to form a physical object. Nearly anything you can imagine can now be turned into a computer design and can be 3D printed. As the 3D printing industry grows, so does the use of plastic as a raw material for 3D printing. The 3D printing industry is already responsible for generating 5,000 tons of plastic waste. This is the issue that my PhD addresses. The aim of my research is to develop strong, sustainable, and smart materials that can be used for 3D printing. I work with a compostable plastic, which is made out of renewable resources called polylactide. Polylactide, however, by itself, is not strong enough to 3D print components such as your car doors or aircraft panels. My research focuses on reinforcing polylactide with plant fibers to maintain its sustainability, at the same time improve its strength to 3D print such strong components. At this stage, I was not only able to develop, but also test some material combinations that had almost doubled the strength from where I started. In the coming months, I will be working on enhancing this strength further while optimizing the methods to produce these materials. But my research does not end there. I will also be looking at smart behavior mechanisms in these materials. Now you might be wondering, what makes this material smart? How does a material qualify to be called smart? As I said earlier, these materials are made of plant fibers. And plants are inherently intelligent. They respond to changes in their surroundings. You must have noticed how some leaves or flowers open and close as a response to sunlight or rain. What if I told you that our materials could do the same thing? An example can be seen in my slide on the bottom left side here, where a flat structure was 3D printed in our lab using these sustainable materials. When this flat structure comes in contact with water, it unfolds itself into a table. This is just one example of how we can use sustainable materials for smart manufacturing. I believe that the sky is the limit and we can transform all our manufacturing methods to be more sustainable while being smarter through the power of research. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Lakshmi. Wonderful research, how fantastic. These are inspiring, mm -hmm. terrific. Right, frantic note taking. Excellent. Good. 
How's the feeling of relaxation, Chris? <laughs> Heartbreak is heart, heartbeat is coming down. Very good. Wonderful. It's also excellent to see everyone's supporters here. Thank you, supporters, supervisors, family, Fano, friends. Terrific. Right, we are now ready for our third presentation. Please welcome Xiong Ching Rung to the stage. Kia koutou, dajia hao. Are you curious about uh, New Zealand Chinese media content and Chinese communities preferred political parties? Here's my story. When I was a community radio broadcaster at Hamilton around 2020 election time, many audiences called in to ask about their uh, interest in political news, but they couldn't find the information on which political parties benefit for themselves. And they didn't want to follow their case to vote for the specific political party. And those experiences made me to explore the Chinese diaspora media use and political engagement in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm using the mixed research method, the quantitative research completed last year with more than 200 respondents, and I'm doing qualitative research with over 30 participants to express their ideas, experiences, opinions about media use and political engagement in New Zealand. And there are two innovations. First of all, it's about social media, WeChat. WeChat is kind of WhatsApp. And in my study, over 90% of participants used or using WeChat. Uh, in 2017, both uh, Labour and National Party launched WeChat account. They released some articles, news, party policies to help those migrants who can't understand English to help them access the information. The second one is about voting. The same result with uh, past studies, which is Chinese communities uh, still prefer the national party or than other parties. However, there's a split for the preferred prime minister. Why? I hope I can find the answer in a further qualitative study. So I hope this study can uh, help Chinese New Zealanders to understand the diverse media sphere uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, to help them develop an independent thinking on uh, government policies, uh, party policies, and voting decisions. And thank you, Namihi, Xixie. Thank you very much, Jinxing. That's Excellent, wonderful. That brings us to that um, three speakers. Um, two more to go and a virtual. 
It's an intense time as we consider each presentation. All very, all very good. Thank you. Well, thank you, people. Thank you for pausing. Um, I'm very delighted to welcome Kimberly Norman to the stage. Kimberly. My research on a topic that very few people want to talk about. It's on a list of important things, but governments tend to sweep it under the rug. It's too complicated, they say. And it is, to be fair. But 34% of all New Zealanders are suffering from this health issue, with huge inequity at 51% Māori and 71% Pacifica all suffering from this health issue. And our rural areas suffer even more, with less resources or support services. And it's not even just this health issue, it's what this health issue leads into. It's diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer, depression, anxiety, social isolation, spiritual disconnect, early death, and suicide. This health issue cripples individuals' quality of life. Families and whanau are torn apart by losing their loved ones too soon. Communities are struggling, and the health system can't cope. It will crumble if this is not addressed. Yet, it's preventable, treatable, reversible, whatever you want to call it. Either way, we need to talk about the health issue, that is, obesity. Now, the Ministry of Health positioned general practice as best suited to deliver this care. You know, they see their patients a lot over time, and it takes time to lose weight. It, it, it makes sense. But despite weight loss options available, obesity rates have continued to rise. And the quality of life of our people, our children, our mokapuna, has only gotten worse. Something is not working. My research took to find out what was going wrong in this space. So I interviewed GPs, nurses, Māori health professionals, and compared their views with their patients, clients, and rural community members, and expecting to find a whole bunch of little issues that could be nice and easily fixed, but no. No, what we found was a far bigger problem. Turns out, most of our clinicians and clients actually disagree with the Ministry of Health, and they want a specialist obesity service located outside of general practice. My research works to bring the views of our Ministry of Health, our clients, and our clinicians together so we can make a comprehensive, multi-layered, culturally safe solution to improve health outcomes for all of us. My research is vital at reducing inequity and is currently being used as evidence in the New Zealand health reforms. My research, along with the voices of these rural communities, will ensure that our future generations don't have to suffer. Namihi, thank you. Kia ora, Kimberly. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well done. Um, very good. Thought provoking presentations.
Well, we are ready for the last contestant. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have someone zooming into us, uh, but they aren't part of the competition. Um, but uh, please welcome the last presenter here on the stage, Tanith Gordon. The story of childhood homelessness is my story. I experienced homelessness as the child of happily married parents with full-time jobs. Not the stereotype associated with homelessness, and yet this experience and the associated trauma means the likelihood that I would be here studying at the doctoral level is so low that I am a statistical anomaly. Homelessness is an adverse childhood experience and, like various forms of abuse and neglect, causes far-reaching trauma. In 2021, there were a series of headlines that showed that the issue of homelessness is seen in New Zealand society. We know that there are New Zealand children living in cars, on the streets, and in overcrowded or emergency housing. However, this, courage, uh, this coverage is very reminiscent of the old adage that children should be seen and not heard. The media is showing we see that there is an issue with childhood homelessness, but we are not hearing the voices of these children. My research is about the impact that childhood homelessness has on education, and this is based on the acknowledged gateway that education has on the positive impact on life course outcomes. My research is a narrative inquiry designed to capture the stories of these children. I will conduct semi-structured conversations with these children with an integrated art project to be painted as we talk so that they can share their stories. The children children aged eight to 12 who have experienced homelessness. This research is important because these children need to be heard. They matter. And the more that we understand, the more we're going to be able to support them. It is not these children's fault that they are homeless, and yet they are the ones that stand to pay the highest price for where they are. It is imperative that we give these children a voice and power. This is about justice. It is time to give these children a voice and a place in the conversation because the, this will ensure that they are empowered and we are empowered to support them, to help them help themselves because the only way to capture these stories, stories like mine, is to listen to the children. Kia ora. Kia ora, Tanith. Well done. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful to hear that research as well. I uh, mentioned before that we do have someone joining us on screen. I'll just give the judges a bit of time to make their notes, and then we'll cross to Christopher Dunn.
wonderful. Now with the, um, the use of our Zoom technology, we'll cross to Christopher Dunn. Look at things frustrated and annoyed people on this slide. What do you think their problem is? Well, they were doing important work on their devices, which they thought had plenty of charge in them, enough to get the job done. But don't you hate it when your phone says it has 20% charge left in it, and then suddenly nose dives and goes flat within about 10, 10 seconds, 10 minutes? And what about that used Nissan Leaf that you want to buy? The capacity bars are supposed to give you an idea of how many charging cycles the batteries have left in them, and hence how many more years of life the car has left. And the person having the pacemaker fitted really wants to know how long the battery powering it is going to last. <clears throat> and unfortunately, the current prediction models can only tell us approximately how long the battery will last, so the cardiologist has to build in a large safety factor and replace the battery long before it has really worn out. So despite decades of chemical and engineering research, prediction of battery life is still a surprisingly inexact science. Why is this? Well, I believe it's because the voltage and current measurements that researchers use to design the theoretical circuit models that go into battery management systems have been made in the wrong place and in the wrong way. So my PhD involves making measurements using charge-discharge waves at frequencies that correspond to the actual usage cycles of real batteries that are charged, say, daily or even weekly. Now, unfortunately, these frequencies are very low, and the measurements are difficult to make and take a long time. But if we can make these measurements, we get into the region of the graph that you can see on the slide with a question mark in it. So we're looking in this region because we know that it contains a lot of valuable information, corresponds to the daily or weekly usage cycles of real rechargeable batteries, and because I know that nobody has looked here before. Now, I've been doing this for just over 18 months now, and I think I'm getting pretty good at it. And my colleagues and I can use this information to construct battery models and management systems that are much more realistic than the ones being used at the moment. To stop your cell phones and laptops from dying when you thought they still had plenty of charge in them, to give you more confidence when you go to buy that used electric vehicle, and to stop vulnerable patients having to go into hospital to have back pacemaker batteries replaced months or maybe years earlier than is really necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. Um, that brings the 3MT PhD thesis presentation to an end, but before we go to our intermission, I'd like to invite all the finalists to the stage for a robust round of applause. So please come on up to the stage. All of you should... And I'll tell I'll tell everyone what's happening next. But you can you can feel the tension released from the room, can't you? It's a, uh, our people are much more in a happy state now without having to worry about the three minutes and what they're saying within the three minutes. So a really wonderful round of presentations. Thank you, everyone. Now we will go to an intermission. There will be light refreshments just uh, set up in the playhouse for you, and the cash bar is open. But before we go there, I'd like to remind everyone to use the QR code to vote for the people's choice. So don't forget this. Um, and we have about till about 7 o'clock till we're due back in here. 
Um, so you've got, make sure you do that within the first 20 minutes. What we will do is when we return, um, when we come back here, we will be um, treated to another presentation. The winner of the Masters 3MT, Jesse Barnett, will present um, their particular award-winning presentation to us. So, um, and then after we hear from Jesse, then we will uh, allocate prizes to the winners. So thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, presenters. We'll see you back here at 7 o'clock.
Kira Koto, welcome back to um, the final part of this evening's event. So I hope people got a chance to eat and drink something and catch up. Um, when we left in the first part of the evening, we could feel the tension just float away from our contestants. And now we feel it's back again. <laughs> so we've got to that part of the evening where we're waiting um, to find out who the winners are. Before we do that, however, I'm delighted to be able to uh, introduce our 3MT Masters winner. So please, um, Jessie Burnett, um, uh, please welcome Jessie to the stage and thank you, Timekeeper, again for uh, keeping us on track. Jessie, welcome. <laughs> people here are tired? How many people here have been so tired that you've started making mistakes? Maybe too tired to drive. How many of you have been so tired that you've truly struggled to get out of bed? That just being awake and thinking basic thoughts was exhausting. You may have experienced this if you've had COVID or the flu. Tiredness and fatigue are interesting because on the one hand, Tiredness is such an everyday experience. And on the other, severe fatigue can be devastatingly debilitating. Yet we tend to conflate these two things and struggle both to acknowledge and tell these stories. How many stories can you think of in which tiredness or fatigue play a central role? I would actually say quite a few. The trick is, it doesn't tend to be explicit. We tend to locate fatigue in the margins in a passing comment, a metaphor, or the overall tiredness of the language used. Take, for example, Kafka's short story, The Metamorphosis, the one where the guy wakes up as an oversized insect. We can think of this story in a number of ways, but really, we have the story of a young man, the sole provider for his family, who awakes one morning to find that he's overslept, and his body has betrayed him such that he cannot get out of bed to go fulfill his role as a productive member of society and the workforce. As he struggles to get out of bed, he fears he'll be blamed a perfectly healthy malingerer. He blames himself. What's the use lying idle in bed? When his family and boss see his state, their support is not forthcoming. If you've been following the recent news on long COVID or other fatiguing conditions, some of these narrative threads might sound familiar. In my research, I compare modernist fiction with those um, kind of recent newspaper articles on long COVID. And patients are regularly quoted citing these same fears of lack of support, struggles returning to work, disbelief, and self-blame. So why do we care? Why does this matter? In a time when long COVID is affecting so many people and other um, fatiguing conditions are as well, the stories we tell help shape experiences and reality. Not only do we rely on the language of story to convey our experiences, but it also helps to inform the perspective and expectations of the rest of our society. It helps inform the perspectives of medical professionals, politicians, employers, friends, family. And in the last 100 years, the stories we tell haven't changed an awful lot. We need to pay attention to the stories we've told in order to help shape and learn from the, uh, the stories we're going to tell. Now, as always, stories matter. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Wonderful to hear that and to, and congratulations again for your, uh, for your win for the Masters 3MT. So we do come to that time in the evening where we get to find out um, the, um, the way in which the judges have allocated the prizes. Um, we do have a chance now to get some generic feedback for everyone. Um, but also from me, I would like to say to all of the contestants, well done. It was amazing and inspiring. Uh, and being here on the stage and working through nerves and delivering your presentations was fantastic. So well done, everyone.
So I'll, I'll, at this stage, I'll invite um, Putani to do the general feedback, and then we'll go through presenting the prizes from people's choice to second to uh, first, but we'll also discuss this beautiful award that they're getting as well. Tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā koe wirimu, nau rā i whakatau mai i a mātou i tēnei pō, i tuwhiratia tēnei hui me ngā karaki e ki te runga rama hoki, nā reire mihi ana kia koe. O tira kia tātou katoa, tēnā koutou. It's my privilege to give some feedback on behalf of the judging panel, and uh, I'm not sure that I can keep it to three minutes, but I'll give it a go. Um, we were so impressed uh, by all of the presenters this evening, and we recognise that an enormous amount of work goes into that three minutes, and that you've probably been practising for ages and um, and, and and preparing for this for this evening, and um, how impressive it is that you can get up and recite. Uh, for three minutes, the presentation that you've put so much preparation into. So um, congratulations to all of you on your memory work and your preparation that's gone into this evening. Um, it was really difficult to judge. Uh, there were such a variety of topics, really different um, topics, and they, they're difficult to compare. Um, we recognise that you're at different stages of your research as well. So while some may be able to sort of talk more about conclusions, others are still signposting or signalling where the research is going. Um, so we took that into account. And we also recognise that we've, this um, competition puts you well out of your comfort zone uh, to have to come up here and to distill what is quite complex, complicated research um, questions uh, into a three-minute, simple language um, recital of your work. So um, congratulations to you all um, for what you've achieved. We thought it was utterly fascinating and interesting and really impressive. Um, so irrespective of the outcome of the awards, uh, you should um, consider that it's an incredible achievement uh, and that we were all totally impressed with what you delivered this evening. Also a word for Christopher who was online, we thought that was a, that he made a great effort as well and it was a real shame that he wasn't able to participate. Um, so on in behalf of the judges, our sincere thanks and congratulations for what you've all achieved. It was absolutely our privilege to uh, witness your presentations and we, we think you were all excellent. Kia ora. Thank you very much. So we get to that point now. And I would like to invite Marlene to the stage to first present um, the People's Choice Award. So thank you, Marlene. I'm glad I don't have an envelope to rip open or anything. <laughs> um, so this year, the People's Choice Award goes to Chris Kramer Walter for his kiwi fruit. <laughs> oh, I oh know that's, is that a, that's that, does he get that? No. Congratulations, Chris. Um, now I'm going to invite Keith to um, come to the stage and present the runner-up award. Remember this award is the $500 towards research. Um, so Keith, please come and let us know. Um, I'm pleased to present this award. Um, this was the hottest contended award between the judges um, and we found it worked out quite well because Chris was the person we argued about, to be honest. Um, Kimberly, runner up. Congratulations, Kimberly. 
Congratulations, Kimberly. Um, it's very exciting here. Um, before we do announce the winner, I'd like to invite Wiramu Puki to come back and to actually tell us more about the meaning and significance of this beautiful award, the John D. McCraw Award. Wiramu is a research associate with us at Farewananga Waikato, working with other researchers such as Bruce Clarkson, uh, and a deep, deep interest and connection to the whenua here, to the place uh, uh, in Kirikiritaro and around. So I'm really delighted you can be here to tell us more about the award, but do tell us about that connection as well to, to John. I think I was one of those students at high school that might have got a PhD with A marks, uh, past high school with difficulty, <laughs> with A for absence. <laughs> anyway, kia ora everyone. Um, for those of you who may have remembered my late father, Hari Puki, he was the co martyr of this, uh, this, this, uh, this institution, this university. Um, <clears throat> I do belong to Ngati Wairere, and in my mihi I talked about the actual original old name of this land, Putikitiki, which had led to the renaming of Voltevsky Street. Uh, to be called Putikitiki, which was the gully that extended where the Hamilton Lee School is, but it was actually the name of the entire block of land. And the meaning behind the name actually refers to the, um, the top knot of a rangatira and the feathers that were collected, the tail feathers that were collected from the huia and those uh, and other birds as well. So that is the actual name of this, of this land, Putikitiki. Well, without further ado, I'm just going to briefly talk about Professor John Davison McCraw. I first met Professor McCraw at the Waikato University in 1995. Me and another friend of mine, Dante Bonica, we were demonstrating uh, for a very packed gallery of uh, very interested uh, people of the community the ancient technology of stone tool making and making stone answers. <clears throat> so for a good six hours, I sat on that, that hard slate floor on the second gallery there while John was sitting in a very comfortable leather chair in the corner just watching uh, my every move. And then the conversation started from there. How science and Matauranga Māori can actually work together. And uh, the narratives and the, the analysis that we looked, we looked into our traditional stories like um, how did, you know, from that perspective that I was able to bring to Professor McCraw, we were able to work collaboratively around the earth science aspects of things, geology, the soil mapping of soils around, along the riverbank. And uh, John really, Professor McCraw really inspired me. He was also one of the foundation professors of this university, along with Professor uh, uh, James Ritchie as well. James Ritchie was a wonderful mentor to many of our young people in Waikato Tainui. Um, the the tiki wānanga that I carved here was entirely carved with stone tools, but I've always crossed my mind to go to the British Museum and swap it, uh, swap it for, the uh, for the original and bring it home. <laughs> but it's a symbol of the whare wānanga. It was generally only held by the tohunga, Ahurua, who was almost like the equivalent of a professor. So it's a tribute to the scholarship, to the aspirations of our, many of our PhD students. In many ways, they, they are the mavericks of this world. And that maverick way of thinking is something we should be encouraging and cultivating. You know, to have that sense of uh, being able to challenge oneself to think outside the square and to enjoy the learning pathway that we do. So the, the trophy that is here today is, is, a, is, is worthy to acknowledge the mana uh, that goes with the, the type of research that uh, you have presented tonight. I'm really, really always impressed with what I see. I'll leave with some wise words of my late father, Hare. The more one knows, the less they know. So all through life, one of the things that I always enjoy is there always the opportunity to be humble enough to learn and to take on new ideas at every opportunity. So that's me, Kia ora tato, and uh, 
I'll hand it back to you. you to stay here while we do this next part of it um, and I'm really delighted to welcome back Tania to introduce uh, to announce the winner um, of of the 3MT competition tonight Tania uh, Kia ora. Um, the judges were unanimous in deciding that the winner of the 3MT doctoral competition 2022 is Congratulations, yes, yes, congratulations, Lucky. <laughs> and congratulations, everyone. It really was an impressive um, array of research and presentations, so we're really delighted uh, and um, uh, totally impressed as, as the judges were. Um, it's my Pleasure now to bring our evening to an end, uh, to wrap up proceedings. And uh, I want to thank everyone, thank the judges for their incredible work tonight. Uh, never easy doing this job. Um, and we could hear them debating um, and, and talking through upstairs. So thank you so much. Thank you all the supporters of the speakers who have come here tonight, uh, parents, whanau, friends, supervisors. Uh, wonderful to have that support here with our presenters. Um, a huge thank you to Tamata Kairangi staff. Gosh, they need their own round of, some, of applause. Um, it's a, um, it certainly is a big event to put on and to make sure it's done correctly to those rules um, for the presenters to go on and then compete in the next stage. And the, and the event isn't really over yet. So Tina was telling me that she now has to organise um, uh, recordings of, the, of uh, the winners and then to get that um, into the, to the, to the next event. So thank you so much. Um, as Wiramu has said, you know, we need to be mavericks and to uh, continue the theme I started with, with Top Gun. Uh, it has been a top evening. We have stretched uh, the ways in which we think about certain knowledge from our research projects. We know that you are breaking new ground, which is fantastic and exactly what you should be doing as our top PhD students. So well done, everyone. Before people leave, um, we will need the contestants to stay and the judges to stay for some photographs um, and Wiramu as well. But um, at this point, I'll ask Wiramu to come back and do our closing karakia. Would that be awesome? Nā mihi. Mia nui tātou. Ke hōra te māori lō. Kia whakapapa paula mu te moana, hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i a tātou katoa, hui e tāhi ki e. Kia ora tātou.